Father, we thank you for you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are as it relates to being God in our lives. So Holy Spirit, as I share with our congregation this morning, Felix moves out of the way and Felix dies. Um, God, I just, I just so love these people, Lord, and so love this church that you've blessed me with that I never want to be in error as it relates to sharing what the Lord is saying to me to them. So you've spoken to me first, and now you're speaking through me to your congregation. So I die, and I move out of the way that you would get the glory and the honor, God. So thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. You're wonderful. You're an awesome. You're a magnificent God. So we submit to you this morning that you get the glory. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Um, before I read the passage and before I um, talk through what I want to share with you, most of you in here, if you've been in church any length of time or depending on your religious or denominational background, you've probably seen the acronym PUSH. And it's P period U period S period H, right? And what that acronym means, at least in some Christian circles, is to pray until something happens. Y'all ever heard that? Yeah, so I've heard it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, and I've been, I've, been, I've been wrestling with that. I've been wrestling that with that phrase, particularly as we have gone through and are going through this place where we find ourselves as a church. Now, I want the record to reflect there is nothing wrong with the phrase. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with praying until something happens. But I just want us to, to push a little further this morning, no pun intended, right? Just to go a little further this morning because... My problem, my problem with the phrase is that, and this is just me, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those who make it up, is that we pray until something happens, and then when the thing happens, we stop praying. You kind of get it? You, you get it? Yeah. And, and, and then, and then we, we start saying, hey man, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good, you know. And, and we celebrate the thing that had happened, and all of a sudden prayer then takes a lower position as it relates to our spiritual journey. And the reason I want to bring that up is because we forget a lot of times that we are in a world where the enemy never stops pursuing us. Does the statement make sense, right? His goal at all costs is to tear us down and to destroy, here's an interesting word, the kingdom of God down on earth. And, and when, if we only have a list of things on our shelves that we pray for, and the list has a starting point and an ending point, we, we go through this, I'm going to pray until something happens on this, and then we move that off the list, I'm going to pray until something happens on this, and we move that off the list, I'm going to pray as if until something happens, and we move it. But, but what I want to caution you this morning is that you take it off the list, but the enemy puts it back on. <laughs> I want you all to get that. I want you to get that, right? And, and, and then, and then, and then I, I, I just, uh, you know, as I'm processing that, even in my own life, that was my pattern, right? That was my lifestyle. And I think God is challenging me to be a little different. Matter of fact, if I were to give you an Old Testament illustration of what I'm speaking about, you would go with me, if you go to me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, right around verse 7 through 10. Here's what you're going to find. Let me just um, state it to you, so you can, because you're all familiar. This is the scenario where um, God showed up to Moses on the backside of Sinai through the burning bush, and then God says to Moses, listen to the words, I have indeed heard the prayers of the people, and I have come down to deliver them, right? And so he commissions Moses, and he says to Moses, I need you to go on mission with me to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to say to him to let my people go. Now, the reason I use that example is I want you to hear me say as clearly as I can, God came down 400 years after they were enslaved in Egypt, okay? Now, lock into this. I'm comfortable in saying, because the text says when God was speaking to Moses, I have now heard the prayers of the people and have come down to rescue them. It seems to me that there was, even though it may not expressively be stated, an implied pattern in the life of the Israelites that 400 years prior to God responded, they started praying, Lord, you got to get us out of this. Y'all didn't expect that. And for 400 years, they were praying, 
You got to hear this. For 400 years, and, and I'm, I'm even comfortable in saying, and, and they never stopped praying. They kept praying, they kept praying, they kept praying. And the reason they kept praying, it was until they kept praying until God heard and God came down and decided to rescue them. Now, don't make the mistake in thinking that God did not hear the very first time they prayed. Don't make that mistake. But what I do want you to hear me say is the continual prayer that they kept doing. And then in God's timing, in God's place, he comes down and he sends Moses to go to Pharaoh and say to him to let God's people go. And the reason I want to bring that up is because I want to talk briefly this morning as we look at the text that there's a place where on our spiritual journey there's a need for persistency in prayer. There's a need to keep beating God's door down. There's a need to keep beseeching God. There's a need to keep in constant communication with God. Come on, y'all. So so that he can stay engaged with us. And there's some blessings and benefits that we receive from that. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, if you look at the text that's in front of us, it's a weird example that that I find kind of challenging, but I want to just talk through it um, briefly to kind of bring us up to speed so we can kind of walk through this and see and hear uh, what God is saying. So look with me, look with me at verse 2. I want to pick up right at verse 2 of chapter 18, and I want to read a scenario And I'm going to do the best I can to explain it, but I want to communicate what Jesus was trying to communicate here. If you're at verse 2 of chapter 18, say amen. Amen. Here's what verse 2 all the way through verse um, 6 says. And he said in a certain city, this is Jesus speaking now, there was a judge who who neither feared God nor respected man. I'm in the ESV. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while, verse 4 said, he refused. But afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, Lord Jesus. I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. I don't, what in the world? (laughs) Come on, y'all. What, what, what in the world, right? So, so, so there's a couple of things I want to point out about this passage just in front of us, right? Here's this parable of this judge and this widow. And, and, and I want to take a moment to look at the characters of this particular pericope or this particular passage or this story and, and see if we could make some sense out of it. First of all, look at the judge, right? The judge was, we, we can't call him a religious leader because the text is clear in saying that he had no fear for God. And, and he had no reverence or respect for man, right? So here's, here's what that means in English. He didn't care what you think about him. You kind of get what I'm saying? And then more importantly, based on the text, he didn't care, care about what God said he ought to do because he had no respect, no reverence, no fear for God himself. So we can't say that this man was part of the religious council, be it Sanhedrin, be it a Pharisee, be it a Sadducee. We can't say he was no doubt, by virtue of the fact that he was judged, some sort of a political official or individual that had no affiliation with the church at that particular time, just living his life, and we can even speculate he was probably an evil person that didn't care or think about people. Sound like somebody we know, amen. I'm not going to get in trouble, amen. And then, and then secondly, look at the widow, right? So this widow, here's what I want you to, to, to recognize about the widow is that don't make the mistake of interpreting that term widow through present day context. Because remember with me, back in Jewish culture in Palestine in that particular day and time, a woman could be as young as 13 to 14 years old and get married. Right, So we don't know if she was a young widow whose husband's passed 
or if she was an older woman whose husband's past. But the, what we do know for sure is that she was positioned in a place where certain injustices were being uh, allotted or distributed to her because of her state or position of being a widow. So what that probably means or means in the text is that her husband died and provision was a challenge to her. It might be attributed or related to her husband's estate. Maybe they weren't distributing the funds properly. Maybe somebody was taking advantage of her as it relates to a business deal. Maybe somebody wasn't paying up. We don't know what the sets of circumstances were, but what we do know is that she would go to this judge. Look at the word crest. She would go to this judge on a regular basis, and she would say, Judge, I'm not being treated well. I'm not being taken care of. I'm not being provided for, and you're obligated to take care of me. And here's what the text says when you look at the judge's response. Forget you, lady. Go on about your business. I ain't got time for you. I want you to get the extent of what the text was saying, right? Because the descriptive is saying that he, never, he neither feared God, he neither cared, cared about people. So this widow that was approaching her, he had no heart for her. He had no concern for her. He had no dealing with her. But he kept, he, every time she show up, he'd say, go away. Right? But then the text says, the text says, I love the third thing. The, the, the widow, the widow, when you look at the text, it says, it says, let me read this again. It says here, and there was a widow in that city, verse 3, she kept coming. She kept coming. Let me say it again. She kept coming. All right? So, so in other words, it was, in other words, what the visual that gets to my mind is that he'd say, get out my face, lady. And she said, see you tomorrow. <laughs> you can't get it, right? And, and, then, and then he'd say, get out of my face, lady. And she'd say, see you tomorrow. You, you kind of get what I'm saying. So, so here's what the text kind of implies. There is nothing that judge could do to her to stop her from coming back to him. And she kept coming, and she kept coming, and she kept coming, and she kept coming, and she kept coming. And after a while, the judge says, I thought I was crazy. <laughs> and then look at, look at the judge's response. Look at his response, right? Look at the response. It says here, and then he says now, verse 4, for a while he refused, but then afterwards he said to himself, now, I know God ain't got no problem in my life, but this woman, she more persistent than God. He says, yet because this woman keeps, and my translation says, bothering me. <laughs> Some translator says that, that, understand with me, he didn't care about his reputation, right? He didn't care what you think. But some translators said it's almost as if she was hitting him to the point where she's dealing him a black eye, right? She kept persistent. She kept showing up. And so his thing was, I wanted to kind of say to her, shoe fly don't bother me. So as a means of getting rid of her so she can stop coming, he pretty much said to himself, I really don't care about you, but let me just go ahead and take care of this so I can get some sleep. You guys are tracking with me, right? And, 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 and don't miss this. The only reason he gave in wasn't because he was nice. It wasn't because he cared. Come on. The, the, the reason we're seeing that he gave in, it wasn't because she was all that. Come on. He, he said, I don't care about God and I don't care about her. But this bothering thing. I'm in the middle of eating my meal. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. And my servants come, judge. Yeah, it's her again. <laughs> Y'all get it. You can't get what I'm saying. I'm in the middle of taking a shower, getting ready to go to bed. Judge. She's back. It's her again. So, so and, and his servants were probably saying to him, why don't you go ahead and do something about this? And you've got to understand, they've probably been saying this for a long time. But his response, I don't care about her. I don't care about nobody. I only care about me. But because she keeps bothering me. He says, you know what? Let me go ahead and take care of this so I can get some rest. Jesus makes this strange parable, states this strange parable. And then he gets to the place where he now decides to communicate to use that parable 
to say something to his disciples. I find that very interesting. So look at what he says. Let's read this, and then I want to make a couple of state, make a couple of statements, right? And then here's what he says in verse six. And the Lord said, speaking to his disciple, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And then look at verse seven. Well, let me read verse six again. Hear what the unrighteous judge says. Let me say it again. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And then he says this. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? And I just got a couple of things I want to share with you. I'm not going to be long. This trips me out. If such an insensitive character responds to repeated pleas from someone he does not know or care about, how much more, are you getting this? How much more will a righteous God respond to his, I hope, I, listen y'all, if I don't say nothing else today, <laughs> you kind of get what I'm saying, right? Here's Jesus, here's Jesus, listen y'all, this, this brother doesn't even have a heart. This brother ain't thinking about you. This brother ain't thinking about this woman. He's not care, caring about where she is, who she is, where she came from, who made her. He don't care about where she's going to be buried. But because she keeps bothering him, that in time she wore him down. Now pause for a moment. Pause. If, if, if a wicked, heinous, diabolic, insensitive, un, y'all not hearing me this morning, ungodly, character can be wore down by persistency. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. What about a God who has a heart? <laughs> what about a God who cares about you? Oh, come on y'all. What about a God who loves you? Come on. What about a God who created you? What about a God who cares for you with a heart Imagine what he's going to do. I got a little two-year-old grandbaby, and he's going through what culture calls the terrible twos. That means that there are times my daughter took me out to breakfast Friday, and she brought my little favorite dude with her. I got to be careful because the other grandkids in D.C. are watching. One of my favorite dudes. Amen. And, 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 and when she brought him, you know, he shows up at the restaurant, and he hadn't seen me in a couple of days, so he's attached, he's attached to mommy. You kind of get it? And then I said, boy, now he come to me. Yeah, he goes through all that. I don't want you. He just kind of shoes me away. And I'm like, cool, I'm cool. And I kept saying, come on, boy. Yeah. You, know, you know, you figure it's my default state to say, boy, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. But after time, he finally inches his way over. And as grandpa, I hugged that little booger like he ain't never did. No, You kind of get what I'm saying? I didn't care about what he did in the past. Because I'm not a wicked judge. Right? I want you, I'm going somewhere with this as it relates to our relationship with God. Because some of us in here have done to God, eh, I want to, uh, come on, I won't have nothing to do with you, uh, but then when we found ourselves in need and he showed up, he acted as if we had, I wish I had somebody in here, as if we had never done anything wrong. I know I'm not talking about only myself because some of you in here, like me, have turned your back on him. Some of us have failed him. And here's what God is saying. Imagine if an insensitive character can respond to repeated pleas from someone he does not know or care about. How much more will a righteous God do what? Respond. So two simple things and then we're going to commune. Number one, here's some principles. God promises quick justice to his children who cry out to him 
How long? Y'all get this? Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at what it says. Right says, verse 6, and the Lord says, hear what the unrighteous judge says, verse 7, and will not God give justice to his elect? Electos is the Greek word, right? Meaning that people he is who have, he is called by name, people who have decided to trust him, people who have said, I'm going to take him into my life as Lord and Savior. And don't, make the, don't miss the prerequisite who cry out to him. How often? Don't, don't, don't miss that. Who cry out to him. How often? You, you kind of get what I'm saying, okay? Very, very important, very, very important that we not miss that. Number one is I want you to get the thing that the principle says that God promises quick justice to his children who cry out to him day and night. The reason, the reason I like that text, because sometimes when I look at my life, and I think when we were, if we were to evaluate our life, we have taken the place of the wicked judge. We have been disobedient to God. Come on, we have failed God. Come on, talk to me. We, and, 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 then, and I'm going to talk about this, this thing with the enemy in a little while, but yet and still when we come to him, he opens up his arm, right? Now, here's the piece with justice that I want you to understand, and, and what's not expressively stated in this parable and the danger now of reading this parable in isolation. For you to really get the true context of what this passage is talking about, you've got to really back up to chapter 37, right? And then particularly the B part, uh, I mean chapter 17, and specifically the B part of chapter 17, and we don't have time to go into all of this, but here's what he's saying. Look, look specifically at verse 20, right? And what he's speaking about in verse 20, what is that? All the way to 37 of chapter 17, which is the context, um, he was asked by the by, by the Pharisees, when is the kingdom of God, let me be, being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, listen, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, Right? And then verse 22, he goes on, he talks to his disciples, and we don't have time to read it. He's telling them about what the kingdom's going to look like. Two will be walking in the field. One will be taken away. The other will be left. He's talking about the suddenness of the kingdom of God that's going to come. And so the question that's being asked in, in verse 20 of chapter 17 is, God, when is this kingdom thing going to come? And then Jesus now is trying to communicate to his disciples what they ought to do until the kingdom comes. Don't miss this. Come on. Are you guys tracking with me, right? And then he uses this weird parable to talk about a woman being persistent to an unrighteous judge seeking justice. So here's what he's saying. And, and, and you ought to lock into this, and we're going we're gonna to walk through this in the text. While we are left on earth, here's what I said. Don't make the mistake of thinking that, that all is well and everything is taken care of because we are now existing in a kingdom that, that really is operated, run, and controlled by the demonic realm. Are you hearing me? What God wants is to his, establish his kingdom on earth like it is what? Come on, I wish I had time to go to Matthew chapter 6, but if you were here on Wednesday night, here's the conversation we had. His disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, right? And he says, when you pray, he went through the pretext on the things that he needed them to do. But then the first thing he says, when you pray, is do this. Our Father, who art in heaven, he says, hallowed or holy is your name. Then he says this, your kingdom come, your what? Where? How? So here's what that means. I need you guys to get into a place where the objective, the focus, the call, the, the significance, the importance of your prayer is what I taught my disciples in Matthew 6 to happen on the earth realm today. And so here's the question. When is this thing going to come? And here's Jesus' response. He uses this weird illustration of a woman that keeps showing up to a wicked man's door and she didn't stop showing up until, I wish I had somebody in here, until the man had heart. And it's as if Jesus is saying to me and as if he's saying to you, the kingdom, even though it's distance, it can be here. I just need you to keep showing up. I wish I had somebody in here. I 
Spirit just needs you to keep knocking on the door because God is going to give swift justice. And here's what it looks like while I'm praying. There's times as if I feel as if I'm not making headway. But church, hear me today. The only reason you're alive is because somebody prayed for you. Come on, y'all. Talk to me this morning. Because God is providing quick justice. You don't believe me. Look at the Israelites, right? In all of their disobedience, in all of their defiance, they still remain the people of God. He provided justice for them. So in an unjust world, our focus is not on the people who are wronging us. It's always on God because God will provide the justices. Come on, say amen. Come on, does this make sense, right? And then, so here's, here's the second thing real quick, right? So when God delays, here's this. Faith is needed to face the delay. Let me, 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 let me explain. Let me read the text. Give me two seconds with this. You won't be long, okay? And then he says, verse 7, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? And then he says, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, watch the question, will he find faith on the earth? Okay, Here, here's, what, here, here's what happens. This is my danger with the push statement. Pray until something happens. And then when we see a little something happening, we stop. So hear, hear me. We should keep praying. And I'm going I'm to say this and then we'll share it in a little while. Because there's not a command to stop at the end of answered prayers. Here's what I said in my introduction. You've moved on, but the enemy, like a roaring lion, picks it up, puts it back on the shelf. And if we forget, listen to this, where we are, we'll be caught blindsided. <laughs> if, if your like is like mine, here's what it looked like five years into your spiritual journey. I had that problem. Why is it popping up right now? Because you prayed until something happened, and then you moved on to the next thing, and you forgot which world you're living in, and somebody else put that thing. I wish I had, I wish I had people in here, I wish I had people in here that would be honest about their failings, that would be honest about the things we've been delivered from, that have been honest about the struggle. You want to know why the temptation comes back after you've pushed or prayed or until something happened? It's because you've moved on and the devil kept following you. And Jesus is trying to communicate. So here's the faith. Here, look, at, look at the question, right? The question is, when Jesus comes, what will he find you doing? Will he find you saying, I'm good? Or like the lady in the crazy illustration, I just got to keep coming back. And I've got to be persistent in my requests over and over. Come on, talk to me. And over and over and over again. So lock into this. So here's what God expects. He expects that upon his return, he finds us faithful. Watch the word now. And doing what? Come on, talk to me. And doing what? So here, here's all I came to say to you this morning is this, okay? We're challenged to pray for how long? You get it? Because we've got to recognize your kingdom come, your what? Where? How? Last I checked, earth don't look like heaven. Come on, talk to me. Come on, talk to me this morning. Last I checked, I still see the struggles of earth within the very church of God. Last I checked, I still see the temptation of earth in the lives of the people of God. So here's the thing. We've got to keep praying until we transform this earth that we live in and it looks like heaven. We can't say we just did 21 days and it's all good. No, 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 no. The end of your 21 days is the beginning of the devil's eternity and he puts it back on the... I wish I had somebody in here. He puts it back on the shelf and if the lesson is to keep showing up and to keep knocking, how dare we stop? Had an elders meeting last week, and 
was coming to the elders meeting and I was saying, Lord, we just got off this 21-day thing. What should we do next? Right? And Lord led me to this text. Here's what verse 1 says. Look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. Y'all get there. Look at, what verse, look at verse 1. You guys there? And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not what? Some of your translation says they should always pray and not faint. Right? You kind of get what I'm saying? So here, here's when I look at the parable. Here's what it says, right? The purpose of the parable is to encourage the disciples to do I pray, not until something happens, but until the parasua or the rapture or the kingdom comes, and to not give up hope. You get it? You're probably wondering when that crazy Egypt thing. For 400 years, they were praying. 400 doggone years. <sighs> Hebrews, what's it, 11, 6 or 13 says, some of them prayed and never saw the kingdom. Never saw it. But don't miss this. But they never stopped praying. You get it? And then 400 years later, God decides to answer. Here's what that says to me. Felix, you got to keep going on, Right? So, so, so look at this. Look at this next thing real quick, and I'm almost there. I want to point this out real quick. So the message of the parable is a call for continued prayer. Now watch this. Not in the sense of praying at all times, but in praying what? Again and a what? The parable. Woman, go away! All right, I'll see you tomorrow. She came back. Woman, go away! All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Here's what God expects at the end of every prayer. Hey, God, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> That's what he expects, right? Hey, God, I'll see you tomorrow. At the end of the next prayer. Hey, God, I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, God, I'll see you tomorrow. You kind of get Y'all get this? Hey, God, I'll see you tomorrow. You, you kind of get it? You, I want you to get this. I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Because we just went through an interesting time. And here's where the, the fast may have ended, but the prayer can't stop. I need somebody to just kind of get this. Why? You're going to get it in a little while, okay? So here's what we're going to be doing as a church, and we'll talk about this later. We've got to figure out how to establish prayer sales now we can have that upper room experience, 24-7 praying until, until, until kingdom, until. You get it? Until kingdom comes. Come on. Until when we show up, it starts to feel like heaven. Come on. Until we start to see the miraculous of God. Come on. Until we start seeing the hand. Come on. I wish I had somebody in here. So, so, so don't, miss, don't miss the graphic, right? The prayer is not until this thing happens, but is until earth looks like the kingdom. And next week I'll talk about the future and the present aspect of the kingdom. Because there's a place where when Jesus was on earth, he modeled what kingdom should look like. And his expectation is that we do the same thing. But if we don't know what we're praying for, we'll pray for the wrong thing. And here's what will happen. We'll stop and move on to the next thing. And what God instructed in Matthew 6 hasn't happened yet. And we wonder why the enemy is always on our trail. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I've got to learn to pray until God kingdom come. Come on, bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful. Holy Spirit, you're awesome. Holy Spirit, you're kind. Holy Spirit, you're gracious. Holy Spirit, you're magnificent, God. And as we begin this dialogue of persistency in prayer, God, as believers, you're calling us every morning to wake up and say, hey, God, and at the end, you're expecting us to say, hey, God, we'll see you tomorrow. What does that look like for us as a congregation? What does that look like for us as a people? What does that look like for us as individuals, God? Persistence in prayer until the kingdom come. You're there. You're going to provide justice. You're going to heal us. You're going to deliver us. You're going to do all of that. But that's not the goal. 
So God, as we go through this, I'm praying that if there's one here that we would all do an introspection and look at our hearts and say, what is God saying to me? And what is my role in all of this, God? So speak to us because some of us praying for an hour was a challenge, God. That was new for a lot of us. Some of us don't even know what it is to do that because we haven't done it yet. But the point that you're saying is to keep showing up every day, keep showing up every day, keep showing up every day. Teach us how to show up every day, God, and how to structure our church. You've been clear, strategize, organize, and then mobilize. How do we do that every day, God, as a body without wearing people out? So thank you for your word. If there's one here that don't know you, bring them, God. And as we prepare to come to this stable on this first Sunday, this is what it's all about. The fact that you died, the fact that you were buried and that you rose and that you're coming again. That's the prayer. The kingdom is coming and we want the kingdom to come. So speak to our lives, God. Move in us, God, in your name we pray.